What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Stefan here from App Stuff. And in today's video, we have a bunch of exciting updates in the world of iOS development and Swift. And we also have some exciting updates with App Stuff here as well. So let's go ahead and dive in. So first up, the Swift SDK is now available for Android. So what exactly does this mean? Who's it gonna be useful for, et cetera. So we have an article here that just does a quick overview of that. The link is in the description, but essentially now you guys can run native Android apps using the Swift programming language. So this is gonna be really good for cross-platform apps that have shared business logic or shared services and things like that. You can write all of that code in Swift now and you can have that available in your Android SDKs and IDEs so that you can combine your business logic and have shared code or cross-platform code. So this was really big at companies like Meta, but we had custom libraries to do that. So this is exciting. There's an article available covering this from Joannis Orlando. So I guess he's part of the Swift team and they show you how to get started and how to go through the next steps of actually, actually implementing this in your project. So it's really cool. There is a Swift Java project that enables you to interoperate between Java and Swift. So it's both a library and a code generator, enabling you to integrate Swift and Java in both directions by automatically generating safe and performant bindings. So now essentially if you have shared business logic between your applications, you can have that all encapsulated in a single code base so that you can share them between the two platforms, which is really cool. So in that same breath, we have this awesome tool that I recently found out about called Skip. So this looks like it's a library that allows you to write Swift UI code and have that automatically build out an Android UI. So we can see here, as you write your Swift and Swift UI source code, the Skip Xcode plugin continuously builds the equivalent code for Android. So this seems to be a pretty robust API and library. So with these two things, guys, it seems like we're getting very, very close to a world in which we can build out Android apps using pretty much only Swift and Swift UI, which I think is incredible. Uh, I have never touched a line of Android code or written any Java to build an Android app myself, but this makes me think about diving into it uh, because we, can, we have these tools readily available to us to help us build out Android apps where we can write most of the code in Swift. And I think Swift is just a much better language than Java or even Kotlin. So before we dive into the rest of our Swift and Apple related updates, I wanted to update you guys with what's going on here at App Stuff. So first and foremost, we are building out this awesome marketplace app in partnership with Supabase. So it's built in Swift UI and Supabase as a backend. The first four parts of the series are currently live and we go over how to build a complete marketplace application where users can upload create and purchase listings here. So it's really just an awesome application that we're putting on YouTube here for free. So make sure you guys check that out. Uh, the first six or seven parts of it are going to be available for free on YouTube. And then I'm gonna turn it into a full pro course with more advanced features like Stripe integration so you can actually process payments, in-app notifications, and all of that cool stuff. And if you guys have never used Superbase before, it's a really, really awesome alternative to Firebase. So make sure you check that out on the YouTube channel. First four parts of the series are currently live at the time of filming this video. Next up, what's new here at App Stuff? Uh, guys, we have new courses available. So if you guys missed it, we have this awesome new AI and machine learning course for iOS development. So it teaches you how to integrate AI and machine learning into your iOS apps. This is the way of the future. If you are not using AI and machine learning in your apps, you are falling behind. So make sure you check that out. Um, and guys, we have updates to our membership as well. The cost of the membership went up because Pro Plus courses are now included in the membership. So Pro Plus courses are our most advanced app builds. Let me go ahead and pull them up here. Right now, we have three courses available, Instagram, Messenger, and Tinder. So these are how apps are built at the highest level. Guys, I'm sure most of you know, I worked at Meta. I'm peeling back the curtain on industry guarded secrets on how apps are built to scale to millions of users. So. It's not about just building Instagram or Messenger and Tinder. It's about leveling up your skills as an iOS developer. And you guys can get access to these courses, which cost $1,000 a pop for uh, a low monthly cost of just 49 bucks a month. Or you could do yearly, which, for, which is annual. Or you could go with the lifetime membership and get access to all of the future stuff for life. So our membership includes everything on the site now. You can cancel anytime. So make sure you guys check that out as well and check out our new courses. And as far as what we have coming in the future, 
I am currently wrapping up a test-driven development course where we are gonna do a full coverage on unit testing and UI testing your apps, CI and CD for continuous integration and continuous delivery, modularizing your applications and all that stuff. And I have a ton of awesome courses planned for 2026. So just wanted to update you guys on what's going on here at AppStuff. We also have this new resources section on the website. So it's got some source code, but it also has free cheat sheets available to you. So if you guys want a free iOS interview cheat sheet, I believe this is like a 10 page document or a Swift concurrency cheat sheet, which I think at this point is like 15 pages, contains updates about changes to Swift concurrency and Swift 6.2 and all that stuff. Um, those are free. We also have a more um, robust interview ebook. This is a 50 page ebook written by myself that contains all of the interview tips and tricks I learned over the years at passing interviews at the highest level at companies like Meta and Google. And this is available for just 29 bucks. So make sure you guys check all of this stuff out. Our courses, our resources, our memberships. So let's get back to the Swift and Apple updates now. Next up, let's talk about one of the biggest updates in Swift, which is Swift 6.2. So we're looking at this article written by Paul Hudson here from Hacking with Swift. And honestly, guys, this is one of the most developer-friendly sets of improvements we've seen in years. And it's not just a small polish release. It, can, it brings real changes to performance, and it changes the way we use concurrency in our applications. So that brings me to the first point in this article, which is going to be SE0466, Control Default Actor Isolation Inference. So what exactly does that mean and how does it affect us as developers? So this is a game changer because it lets you effectively turn your Swift module back into a single threaded environment or program by default. So in practice, it means unless you explicitly opt into concurrency or transitioning to background threads, everything runs on the main actor automatically. So this is a massive change. So here's what that means in plain English. So you can now add a single compiler flag, which is default isolation main actor. You can adjust this in your build settings, I believe. And suddenly your entire module now behaves as if you were annotating everything with at main actor without you having to actually type it anywhere. So now the opposite is true, where when we want things to run on a background thread, we actually apply the new concurrent macro. And we can talk about that later, but here's an example. We have some data controller class that's marked with main actor, right? And as you can see, the abstract creates and uses a main actor isolated type without itself being marked as main actor. So that's okay because it's automatically applied for us. We could even remove the lone main actor annotation and it would still apply. So essentially, TLDR, you don't have to manually apply this main actor macro everywhere now. That happens by default. But you do have to do the opposite, which is applying the new concurrent macro that tells your code to transition to a background thread or transition off of the main thread or the main actor of the application. So this is really cool for developers who are building UI heavy apps or people that just don't have a deep understanding of Swift concurrency because you don't actually have to use Swift concurrency until you actually need it with this new default main actor isolation. So concurrency is very powerful, but it's a very steep learning curve. So many apps simply don't need it for most of their code. But before you guys start worrying, like, is this gonna break my code? You're probably fine. So for example, things like URL session.share.data like when you're making some sort of network call, will still run on its own task rather than blocking your code. So you don't have to go everywhere that you didn't mark things as utilizing Swift concurrency. Um, some of the built-in libraries and APIs that Swift has, like URL session, will run on its own task away from the main actor, so it won't be blocking your main thread. And Guys, most importantly, this change along with others is just part of a larger improving the approachability of data race safety. So Swift is ultimately just trying to make our code safer here. There is a bit of a learning curve with uh, adjusting to these new features, but once you get your head wrapped around it and you do a little bit of practice in your code, it starts to make sense and you're like, hmm, maybe it should have been this way the whole time. So in the rest of this article, he covers all of the other additions to Swift 6.2. A lot of them are kind of insignificant to me. For example, raw identifiers, like I don't really care about this. Uh, personally, don't use that much in my applications. Um, default value in string interpolations. Uh, so in, instead of having to constantly do like a nil coalescer 
or provide a default value. You can now interpolate it with a default input. Cool, but nothing major. Um, collection conformances for enumerated. That's another interesting one. Uh, key path. So here's a way to capitalize all of your strings. You have now have a capitalized key path. Uh, small stuff like this. Uh, the default actor isolation was definitely the biggest one. Another big one is opt-in strict memory safety checking. So this introduces opt-in support for flagging unsafe Swift code as warnings unless specifically desired, which will make it significantly easier to audit unsafe code uses. So essentially, your compiler is now able to recognize when your code might cause data races or might not be thread safe and you can activate warnings to show up in your compiler to let you know where that is happening. Um, there's a new backtrace API, which is gonna help you out with debugging, and there is now weak let. So a lot of people were kind of geeking over this one. It's pretty cool. They introduced the ability to use weak let when declaring properties of a type complementing the existing support of weak var. So if you want a weak reference to something, but you don't want it to be mutable, uh, and you want to use a constant to make it immutable, we now have support with weak let, which is also pretty interesting. And we have transactional observation of values. And you guys can just dive through the rest of this article. Another interesting one was global actor isolated conformances. So check this out. Um, think about updating your code to use Swift 6 and above. Uh, if you're still using Swift 5.5, or Swift 5 in general, you are falling behind. This is the direction of the future. So definitely worth diving into this and starting to implement this in your own applications, guys. Next up, a judge just blew up Apple's control of the App Store. So this actually happened back in April, I think, but this judge in Epic vs. Apple has banned them from charging commission on purchases made outside of the App Store because of its ongoing competitive be anti-competitive behavior. So to give you guys some context, Apple takes a 30% commission for every dollar that you make in your apps. So let's break that down. You make a dollar, Apple takes 30 cents, so you're left with 70 cents. Then you have to pay taxes on that. And before you know it, half your money's gone. So this judge didn't like that. And now in this major ruling, a judge ordered that Apple is banned from charging commission fees on purchases made outside of the App Store. So you can now redirect people away from your actual iOS application to a web-based paywall, and you can charge them through your own system, like say Stripe or Square, whatever it is, and Apple can no longer take commission on those fees. So we're seeing major apps start to implement this because they don't want to give Apple 30% of their money. I think Tinder did it. I think Duolingo is doing it. And a lot of other apps are following this. And Apple, being as petty as they are in some situations, will now mark that app in the App Store as like, it'll place some flag on the app. Like they have flags for when in-app purchases exist. And now they will flag it as like potentially unsafe purchases or something like that. That's all they could do to clap back here. But uh, this was a major uh, game changer for Apple's revenue model because I think we're gonna see a lot of people move away from the native Apple payment APIs or paywalls to move them to their own uh, web paywalls that are hosted from outside the application so that Apple doesn't no longer robs you of 30%, right? Maybe if it was like 10 or 15%, we could deal with that too, but 30% and then having to pay taxes after that, like you're taking half my money. And that's just like not fair, right? But anyway, Apple obviously strongly disagree with this and they say they plan to appeal this. But more than just monetary impact, this judge's order effectively weakens Apple's control over how apps on its platforms can guide users to external payment, which is a major shift for App Store economics and power dynamics. So if this is upheld, this could drastically change how in-app purchases, subscriptions, and payments work on iOS, possibly lowering costs for developers and increasing competition slash payment alternatives. This could reshape how apps monetize, how users subscribe, and how tightly Apple controls its ecosystem. And for the last segment in our video, guys, we're gonna talk about our long lost friend, UIKit. You guys remember her? I know I do. Honestly, not very fond memories, man. Like, let's be honest, Swift UI is like the hot new girlfriend, and UIKit is like the ex girlfriend that got fat. You know? Swift UI is just better, let's be honest. But here's the curveball we got a bunch of new updates in iOS 26. So it's like that ex-girlfriend, maybe she got a set of bolt-ons installed, maybe she got some plastic surgery, maybe she did some work on her face, maybe she lost a little bit of weight and you're looking at her and you're like, damn, should I do it? 
Should I? And then you're like, nah, dude, like, let me stick the Swift UI, right? Um, but anyway, let's go through these updates, guys. Uh, this article is a 64 minute read. We are not gonna cover the whole thing. Obviously, if you guys wanna do a deep dive, the link for this is in the description. Shout out to Seb Badal for writing this. And uh, basically, uh, it seems like Apple is trying to shift UI kit towards more of a declarative framework. It's obviously inherently always going to be an imperative framework, but they are introducing changes to it to make it a little bit more declarative like Swift UI. So uh, first up, we have the UI, applica UI application delegate deprecation. So we are no longer using these UI application delegate methods. Here are all the UI scene delegate equivalents, which is what we use in Swift UI. Um, the rest of this article is just about mainly a bunch of UI components that you know, got introduced in iOS 26 with UIKit. It definitely seems like it's easier to build things out of the box and trigger updates and stuff like that. On that note, my favorite part of this update, which was buried at the bottom of this article, was they added the observable, mac observable macro to be able to interface with UIKit, which is huge, right? Because we no longer have to manually trigger updates ourselves, which was one of the most annoying parts about UIKit, apart from all the boilerplate code and how long it took to build the simplest of simple components, right? With how much, it was so ver verbose, right? So much code to put together like a table view, whereas in Swift UI, it's like one-tenth of the code. But anyway, you can now use observable within Swift uh, UIKit so that changes will automatically trigger when things on that observable class modify or change. So that's a big one. That to me is the biggest one. We also have previews in UIKit now for those of you that don't know. So that's really helpful. Um, but yeah, that's gonna wrap it up for this video, guys. Make sure you check out all of this stuff. The biggest changes in my opinion are to Swift 6.2. I think as iOS developers, we all need to be uh, slowly transitioning ourselves into becoming more knowledgeable about the updates and changes in Swift 6.2 because it's gonna change the way that we write code and ultimately lead to safer code that avoids data races and thread blocking and all of that stuff that lead to poor app experiences. So thanks for watching this one, guys. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and uh, stay tuned for more news that we have coming about Swift where I'm gonna try to do these monthly or whenever a big update happens. And also make sure you check us out at appstuff.io. Thanks for watching. Peace.